My name is Karen, and I'm here with your weekly rundown for Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. This week, the radio ministry and the hospitality ministry are brought to you by Barb and Jim Niemeyer in honor of their wedding anniversary. Wow, you guys sure know how to share the love. Thank you so much for your gift of ministry. Well, I know that we are gearing up for our What's Next Capital Campaign huddle. That's happening next week, so I'm giving Angela a break and I'm not making her do any sort of inserts or music to this recording so she can focus on getting all things ready for the Capital Campaign huddle. But I want to tell you some things that are happening in October. I know it's like the first week of fall this week, but it feels like summer. So I want you to turn the calendar to October 8th. That is a big day for Holy Trinity. Not only is it the new member class, it's happening at 10 a.m. right after worship. So if you haven't already signed up for the new member class, please do so. There's a link found in the newsletter on the website and in your bulletin. Uh, the news or the new member class is a great way to meet new people and learn about what it takes to be a Holy Trinity member, as well as a little bit about the Lutheran faith. Now, uh, there's a great group of people already signed up, so there's still time to do so. So make sure you check out that link in your newsletter website or the bulletin. Now, also on October 8th, it is another Grow and Gather. And this time we have a Faith Milestone event happening. Our fifth graders are going to be learning all about Luther's Small Catechism. So if you haven't already registered your student, please do so, so they can get on that email list for the Faith Milestones. Now, you don't have to register separately for the Faith Milestones or the um, uh, Faith Formation, so Crew Time, Confirmation, or Agape. It's all the same. And so uh, as long as you're registered, you'll be notified for Faith Milestones or any sort of other important event. Now, those fifth graders are going to be meeting with Pastor Ben going over the Luther's Small Catechism. So that starts at 5 o'clock, I believe. And Pastor Alicia's Bible study is happening at 5 p.m. also. So both of those groups will be meeting. Pastor Alicia is doing a Bible study on reading Risky Romance, the book known to change lives. So there was a great group that joined last month. Again, this month, you are more than welcome to come. Please bring a friend because everything is more fun with friends. After we have those Faith Milestone classes and Pastor Alicia's Bible study, we'll be having dinner in the fellowship hall. So uh, dinner is at six, followed by Compline at seven. So we had a great group of people show up for Compline, including our beloved Karen Hoylo. Yes, she came back to worship for the first time since the pandemic. So we look forward to having lots of new faces at Compline. If you are unfamiliar with it, it's okay. You can bring a friend. It's always more fun with friends. So, well, that's it for me this week. I'm gonna finish paddling over to my house, but I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks so much for joining us and making worship our priority. Enjoy your day. Good, good night, good evening, good to be with everyone. Is anyone else marveling at the fact that Karen just did that while I kayaking? <laughs> well, we've all maybe had dinner, now we've had our exercise for the evening, and now we will have worship. It's going to be a wonderful time of worship together. I want to also welcome those who are worshiping with us via online ministry. Online, uh, We're united in worship together as we gather. We're going to continue our worship series tonight on law and gospel. It's our second week, so we'll be focusing on the gospel part of things. So it's going to be a wonderful night tonight. As an act of hospitality, I want you to know in the middle of the service, we'll be dismissing crew time. For any guests or visitors who might be here, crew time is our children's ministry for preschool through fifth grade. So if you have a preschool through fifth grader, They'll be invited to leave the worship service if they'd like, and then we'll return before the offering. 
for an age-appropriate message and some time together down the hall. I think that's enough announcements. I'm going to invite you to stand in body or spirit as we worship together. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built on hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Give the love of Christ shall together, I invite you to join me with the words on the screen. Let us pray. Lord God, you have created the Holy Scriptures to be written for the nourishment of your people. Grant that we may hear them and that comforted by your promises, we may embrace and forever hold fast to the hope of eternal life, which you have given to us in Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. You can be seated as we hear a musical offering from Jude T.G.
Jude, I think the preaching is done for tonight. <laughs> Indeed, there, God does give us what we need, and if peace is what you need tonight, I believe God will give it to you. Uh, we're going to begin crew time dismissal. I'm going to invite first our youngest leaders forward, so the preschool through first grade leaders. 
I believe Miss Hannah and Miss Lindsay, if you would come forward. And then any high schoolers who are going to help with pre-K through first grade, if you want to come forward. And then we'll invite preschool through first graders to come and join them and follow them back to Paul's place. will follow the last preschool through first graders. All right, I'll invite our second and third grade leaders forward, Miss Claire and Miss Bailey, as well as any high schoolers who are helping. And any second and third graders, if you want to join them in the front and follow them back to room 205 A and B. will follow the last, second, or third grader back. Have a great time, second and third graders. And fourth and fifth graders, Mr. Brian and Miss Megan, if you would come forward. And then any high schoolers who are helping with fourth and fifth grade. And any fourth and fifth graders, if you want to come forward. And Macy and Nina will follow the last fourth and fifth graders back. the third chapter. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, irrespective of law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel lesson tonight, which comes from the gospel of John, the third chapter. It reads this, No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You can be seated. We're going to be focusing on the Romans passage tonight, from Romans chapter 3, in case you want to follow along in the Bibles around you. After the gospel, as it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and that's where we'll be. But first, I want to start out tonight with a little help from you. So if you, I'm really inviting your interaction. I want you to finish these statements with me. Peanut butter and... Awesome. Multiple action answers. Salt and... Vinegar and... Huh? Ketchup and... Macaroni and... Popcorn and uh... Okay, 
this one you can get right, law and gospel. <laughs> law and order, didn't see that one coming. No, law means order, law and gospel. Okay, um, thank you for starting out tonight. Got to make sure you're awake on a Wednesday night after a long day, but law and gospel is what we're talking about. And they are not meant to be separated. They're meant to be together. Like all those pairs that you mentioned, even if they were different, you see them together. Same is true of law and gospel tonight. One leads to the other and shows us the reason for the other. It's a yes and. Now, last week we talked about the law. In case you weren't here, Pastor Ben told us about how the law gives us two things. It gives us order and it judges us. Gives us order. He gives us examples like a sidewalk gives order to where we walk. Or a driver's license gives us a bit of order on the road. It promotes well-being in life. But law also judges us and helps us to recognize our sin. As I said, today we're going to focus on Romans chapter 3. I think it's a phenomenal chapter. And as we focus on our second week of this law and gospel uh, worship series, Romans 3.20 says this. Thank you. It says, For no human will be justified before him by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. No human's justified, for through the law comes what? The knowledge of sin. The law, it's that second point Pastor Ben shared us, the law brings us into awareness of our sin. So I want to give a couple examples of that before we get to the gospel. We have to see our need for it first. So think about the Ten Commandments with me, which are our most famous laws in the Bible. We're just going to think about a couple of them and see if you can see how the law brings knowledge of sin. So anybody recall what's the very first of the Ten Commandments? Yeah, love God first, you shall have no other gods. So your first re response might be like mine, well, I don't have any other gods in my life. I don't worship a statue of anybody else. I don't practice praying to another god. But then if you read Luther's meaning, like what does this really mean? He says, you should fear, love, and trust God above all things. We have to ask ourselves, do I really love and trust God above all? Do I trust in myself more at times, if I'm honest? I know I do at times. Or think about a different, uh, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Your or my first response might be, well, I haven't lied about my neighbor. But then if you think about the meaning, it's not just about lying. Luther would say, well, what does this mean? Takes it a step further, he says, it's not just about lying, but it's about speaking well of your neighbor and always putting the best construction on what they do. I don't know about you, but do you always speak well of your neighbor and put the best construction on what they're doing? I know I try, but I know there are times I don't. So again, we're going to put up that Romans chapter 3 text and highlight a different point this time. For no human will be justified before him by deeds prescribed by the law. Basically, none of us, none of us are justified by what we do. None of us. We can't be justified by our following of the law, of the Ten Commandments, or any other law. Once we consider the law, we realize we can't follow it. We're just not perfect. Has anyone heard of the Enneagram before? A couple people? Yeah, okay, if you haven't, the Enneagram is a personality profile. It has these nine different personality types for an inventory. And they're, the type one is what I want to talk about tonight. They're considered reformers. 
They tend to be people that have this keen sense of right and wrong, or at least feel they do, and they try to follow what's right. These are the kind of people that if they see a sign that says, do not enter, they won't pass it. They're the rule followers. They can often see when things are right and when they're not, and they do whatever they can to follow it. Well, Martin Luther was an Enneagram One. He was an Enneagram One, and as a priest, he tried really hard to do what was right, what he felt was right in the eyes of God. In fact, he tried so hard, he agonized over it deeply. He was so disturbed by his inability to do what he tried to do. He resonated with what Paul says in the Bible when he says, I do not do what I want, but I do the thing I hate. This was Luther's key struggle as a priest. And he's not alone. When we gather for worship, oftentimes we start with the words of the confession, and we start by saying and acknowledging we haven't done all that we should have, and we've done things we shouldn't have. So I'm going to keep reading Romans chapter 3 as we keep going through this beautiful chapter with you. The next part says, For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no distinction. There's no separation. We've all fallen short. So Luther wasn't alone, clearly. But Luther was disturbed when he was a professor at a college in Wittenberg, University of Wittenberg, and he had this life-changing experience when he was teaching. I have a lot of teachers in the room. But he had this life-changing experience when he was teaching on this very book of Romans. And I think a New Testament scholar has a quote, and he captures what happened to Luther when he was teaching. He says this, the triumph of grace over law fanned the sparks of Luther's troubled conscience into the blaze that became the Protestant Reformation. Basically, he was so overcome by the grace in the book of Romans that it started this Reformation. It changed his life, and he couldn't help but tell others about it. He had this aha moment That law ultimately does one thing. It helps us realize we need a savior, and we can't be it. We can't be righteous. We cannot consistently do the right thing, no matter how hard we try. Again, when we go back to that same text, focus on the end this time. It says, they are now justified by his grace. That would be Christ's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. They're now justified, but it's not justified by their doing. It's justified by who? By Christ and Christ alone. So the good news is that we're justified by Jesus and not our, ourselves. Our righteousness not, doesn't come from our right doing, but what Christ has done. Philip Melanchthon said, the law shows us our disease and the gospel, the cure. Gives us that peace that I think Jude was singing about. So the word gospel is this fancy word that just means good news. And the good news is that we can't earn our way to be righteous, but God has made a way. The good news is there is no one, not a single person in this room, is justified by what what we've done or haven't done. As Romans says, there's no distinction here, but it's Christ's justification. So there's a part of the Bible we call the Gospels, right? Anybody recall what the four Gospels are? What are they, Max? You know one of them? Uh, Yeah, it's the stories of Christ. Where would we find the stories of Christ? Yeah. Matthew, Mark, what comes next? Luke and John. 
but we call them the Gospels because they talk about what Max said. They talk about Christ. It's good news. It's good news that it's not about what we've done, but what Christ has done. It's good news because the Bible says we're justified by his grace, not our own. Well, as I was preparing for the message this week, a book came to mind. One of our favorite childhood books in our home came to mind that we read a lot when our kids were little, and it's called You Are My, I Love You. Anybody read it? I'm just going to share a few lines so you get the idea of the rhythm of the book, or the cadence. It starts this way. It says, I am your parent. You are my child. I am your quiet place. You are my wild. You know it. I am your calm face. You are my giggle. I am your weight. You are my wiggle. I am your carriage ride. You are my king. I am your push. You are my swing. I am your dinner. You are my chocolate cake. I am your bedtime. You are my wide awake. This book has all these lines about the relationship between a parent and a child, what they give and contribute to each other. And I thought about this book, believe it or not, thinking about one of the things Luther wrote in Luther's works in his writings. And I want to share it with you because I think it sounds a lot like this book. Luther wrote this years ago. He said, Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness just as I am your sin. You have taken upon yourself what is mine and given me what is yours. I know a little something about the type one on the Enneagram. I too can follow the temptation, the tornado of temptation, thinking I can do it. I can so easily believe that I'm responsible for making it happen. And I need to be reminded of the gospel. And I'm guessing you do too. And the gospel, the good news is that Jesus has already done it. You can't. And you don't have to. I'm free, and so are you. It's as if a new book could be written for adults about God as our parent and us as his child. And if we wrote something, I imagine it would sound a little bit like this. Forgive me, I'm not a writer. But I imagine it sounding like this. I am your peace. You are my stress. I am your worth. You are my trying hard. I am your care. You are my worry. I am your new life. You are my past one. I am your righteousness. You are my sin. We could go on and on, but we believe God is the parent in the story even in, in your sin, in mine, God saves us. Even in our imperfection, God justifies us. Even in our failures, God loves us, and that is the gospel. That's what makes it good news. But you can't have one without the other. Just like we started, law and gospel go together, yes, like peanut butter and jelly do. Yes, it's jelly. The law shows us our need. The gospel shows us the need has been fulfilled. You're not defined by what you've done or haven't done in life. You're defined by what Christ has already done for you. Christ is your Savior. You are his beloved child. We don't come to church to be enough for God. We come to church to hear he is enough for us. Let's pray. Gracious God, there are so many voices reminding us of what we need to do or be. And God, as we hear 
the good news of the gospel tonight through the gospel of Romans. I believe it is good news like a gospel for us. God, remind us that this is good news for us. I pray that you would transform our mind and our hearts like you did Luther's. And may the law not burden us, but remind us of the gift of your grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able to sing. forward with an invitation and then we'll invite crew time back after that. Hi again. You've seen me for the last three weeks. Um, and my partner Larry on Sunday promised that was the last time he was going to get up and talk, but I've been really careful not to promise that because there's never a last time. 
Um, so just a reminder, our huddles are next week. So lots of you have already RSVP'd. Thank you. Um, we do still have room on Sunday. So if you haven't RSVP'd and you still want to attend a huddle, we would love to have you. Um, we've got room on Sunday. So please let Jamie know in the office. If you could let her know by tomorrow, that'd be great. Um, because as a reminder, we're having this catered. So we need to know how many people to tell the caterer. Um, so again, just a reminder on the dates, it's next Wednesday. There will not be a dinner before the huddle. The dinner will be at the huddle. So just remind, remember that. Um, it's at 6 o'clock, and then the Sunday huddle is on the 1st at 9 o'clock, and there will be a breakfast brunch served at that one. So again, we would love to see everybody there. There will be lots and lots of information, and it will kick off our, our campaign. So come one, come all. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. For any who may be visiting tonight, our huddle is just like a sports team huddles before what's coming next. Same is true for us as a church. We're going to huddle together to talk about the future of Holy Trinity, and then regular faith formation and worship will resume the following week. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie, so much. We're going to invite our crew time students back and gather our offering. <laughs> We'll enter into a time of prayer and we'll begin singing together, Lord, listen to your children praying.
by name. We lift to you today those we know who need your presence. Specifically, we pray for Al, Eric, Sarah, Brenda, Carol, Joel, Tasha, and Brad. We also ask for your comforting presence to surround the family of Hannah Coulson as they grieve her death. You know what we need. We call upon you for your help. to pray. Join me with the Lord's Prayer, if you would. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before the final benediction tonight, just a reminder, confirmation, you'll be in the fellowship hall after worship. Agape, you can go to the youth room. And also on this homecoming week, we hope you have a wonderful weekend as well. But now as you go, as we go, we go to share God's love for all people from one generation to the next. And as we do know, Christ goes with you. Christ goes before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you watching over you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.
Lord. Thank you, God. Right at the top. Three, four.